Paddington Station. Suddenly, the person inside me is consumed with nerves, just as I was on my wedding tour nearly 40 years ago, with confident, smiling Cousin Franklin. But all the way from Bristol, I have been talking and writing. It's what I do. Deep breath. <sighs> Smile. Your Majesty, may I introduce Tommy? <laughs> Miss Malvina Thompson, my secretary. She who makes my life possible. Yes, he is in very good health and wishes he could come himself. But here is a palace. Dinner, gold plates, fine wines, but simple food like the whole country. Do you all like Brussels sprouts? I am between the King and Mr. Churchill. I find him not easy to talk to. Also, at the end of the day, there has been a little too much champagne. And he says the same thing three or four times, which was my experience in Washington when he stayed with us last Christmas. Franklin and he were like two little boys. I'd have to stop them so Franklin could get some rest. He can't catnap like Winston. I know Franklin often feels I'm a spoil sport or a Puritan. Mr. Churchill is shocked by all that I do. The articles, broadcasts, causes, traveling. He thinks women should stay home and keep quiet, which is odd, because that is just what the British women are not doing during this war. Saw a lot of our boys at the Red Cross Club this morning. Hi, Eleanor. How's Poughkeepsie? Now, Franklin, they all have terrible blisters because their socks are too tight. They should have woolen socks. I told the boys. I know you need heavier socks, but you know how the army hates to change. Loud cheers by car with Mrs. Churchill to see the women, many American, who ferry the big planes across the Atlantic. Each girl lined up with her plane in the rain. I insist on getting wet too, my now famous hat with the feathers. We lunch with army cooks. These women can cook anywhere. On field kitchens they build themselves. In blitzed areas, in rain. We have soup, beef and kidney pie, Brussels sprouts. I've been particularly impressed by the spirit of the women I have seen. I loved my nice lunch. It is wonderful what you are doing with the rations. Uh, no, that is how I say it. In my mind's eye, there is Hick, Lorena Hickok, top reporter. Associated Press assigned her to me in 32 during Franklin's campaign. We became close. Once, on a train, we shared a sleeper and our stories. We'd both had terrible childhoods. We'd both been betrayed in love. We opened our hearts and our arms. That first year we wrote 500 letters. Now it's down to 50. Mr. Churchill and I have a disagreement. <clears throat> I am sure Franklin would have a name for it. Oh, Franklin loves to tell stories. It's often how he distracts people from what he guesses they want to ask, and he'll give them names. Well, the stories, not the people. So, when the king and queen were with us at Hyde Park, that's the family home in upstate New York, and there were two accidents, one involving a pile of Limoges plates, the other a tray of decanters, he called it the Hyde Park Cataclysm. I like him, 
and he's very emotional. But I don't want him in charge of the peace. He's still an imperialist at heart, and I am for what Franklin calls the United Nations. We visit a pig club where they are fattening a young and very active pig called Franklin. And a rabbit club with a tiny baby rabbit called Eleanor. I do not know what to make of this. A glimpse of myself in 1918. Wife, mother, no longer a girl. Franklin returns from an official trip to Europe, desperately ill with pneumonia, and I find Lucy's love letters. The bottom drops out of my world. If you'd just run a comb through your hair, dear, you'd look so much nicer. My mother-in-law. Sarah Delano Roosevelt, Mama, all in black, appearing uninvited through the connecting door between the two houses she has built in New York, ours and hers. She was there. Is that for me? What is it? A poppy? She has come to sell me a poppy for Armistice Day. Here you are. <laughs> we are at a secret location. A tiny village near Chester called Tilston de Malpass. Guests of, oh, uh, Mrs. Edgerton Warburton, head of the county WBS. Oh. My little friend is one of her evacuees. Well, families from Liverpool living in her outhouses. They've all found work and seem devoted to Mrs. Warburton. She ploughs with a tractor and has taken to the new order with zest. She is tall, thin, bony, and apparently lives without eating. All she has for breakfast is a bottle of beer. Oh, I occasionally eat a piece of cheese. That day, after a wild, whooping time with the children, running, sailing, jumping in the icy sea, he has sat in his wet swimsuit and then gone upstairs to rest, puzzled at his own fatigue. You're just tired, honey. I'm not surprised. Next day, he is paralyzed. It is three weeks before doctors will say it is polio. Franklin is stoic, smiling through terrible pain, and we have to keep it secret. The great deception begins. Londonderry, where I am presented with two ashtrays, one inscribed to the boss, FDR, of course, the other, Rover, which is my code name over here, Franklin's idea, I suspect, and later, much later, at a Red Cross club, a rather drunken sailor. Hey, Eleanor! Would you like to dance? <laughs> 1918. When I think how we rejoiced then, hardly more than 20 years ago, the waste. At Rolls, I speak to 750 women at midnight, and all the newspaper women look fit to die. <laughs> Mrs. Roosevelt, could you ask for tea? It turns out they have sat up half the night playing poker with the officers at Londonderry. <sighs> I am on the Queen Mary, our flag broken on the masthead, sailing down the River Clyde. Franklin would love this. He loves the sea. I am happiest in the air. All along the river, the men working on the ships are gathered to cheer. And I must look like the Statue of Liberty, only moving, just waving and smiling for a full two hours. 
I kissed him goodbye. I will fly down from Washington, bring him back on the presidential train, coffin flag draped in a lit compartment, all the way from Georgia. I sit on my berth all night with the window shades up, looking out at the countryside he has loved, watching the faces of the people at stations, kneeling at crossroads, coming to pay their last respects all through the night. I never realized the true range and scope of the devotion to him until he dies. It is President Truman who gives me my first ever official job, US delegate to the United Nations. And then I am elected chair of the commission formed to draw up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is the work of which I am proudest. Mr. Pavlov, yes, nephew of the dog man, mane of white hair, words rolling unstoppably down his black beard like a river, till I bang my chairman's gavel hard. We are here to devise ways of safeguarding human rights. We are not here to attack each other's governments. And in December 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is accepted. Mr. Kennedy has been magnificent and the Russians have turned back, backed down. They will remove the missiles and we will not invade Cuba. So, it has been worth it. The vast file the FBI keeps on all my doing. The price the Ku Klux Klan put on my old white head. The partnership apart. You know, I doubted Mr. Kennedy at first, but now I pray he will win a second term in 64, though I shall not see it, nor do I need to. How lucky we are to have him. Fearless, just like Franklin.